Okay, so yeah, so what I would like to talk about today is actually um, the importance of a physical ingredient that's actually a critical ingredient to form a massive black hole seed. I hope to stimulate some discussion, also because I'm going to challenge some of the statements that we heard today. And so with your help and feedback, maybe I can uh, we can model uh, this critical uh, physical ingredient, which is mass loss, better than we are doing uh, right now. Okay, so uh, what I'm really interested in is what happened after the gas has accumulated towards the center and after uh, actually the evolution of the premium sequence star Jarrett was talking about. So I'm really interested in... Uh, uh, sub milliparsec scale. So I'm leaving all those complications to find new ones. So uh, in my opinion, so there are uh, theoretical arguments that I cannot review now to say that uh, the, that pre-main sequence star Jared was talking about uh, forms a uh, rather um, after um, evolving uh, form a rather small black hole so 10, solar masses only. Uh, but still, he is embedded in a halo, which is accreting towards the center, one solar mass per year or so. So it's uh, embedded in a highly super editor accretion flow. So what we think it's happened is that uh, so the, the little black hole start uh, accreting is uh, uh, light is actually, the feedback is actually absorbed by this accreting flow because it's within its trapping radius and it will, will expand the inner part of the disk until finding an equilibrium solution and we will talk about this. Um, uh, so uh, I will show that uh, this, uh, um, uh, this configuration, this accretion configuration will bring to um, the small black hole to a transient, highly super Eddington accretion phase. Okay, so uh, of this configuration has uh, at least main three questions. Uh, so first of all, so what is the structure of the accretion flow very close to the black hole? Uh, so what we use is the theory from a convective uh, uh, dominated accretion flow. Uh, but what we really do, we don't model it. We just take uh, theory from uh, these uh, accretion modes as an energy input into the outer part of the, of the disk. Um, the second uh, question, which uh, uh, both of them I'm not going to address today, is what is the, actually the structure of the interface between this inner part, which is mainly pressure supported, but of course has rotation, and this outer part, which is rotationally supported. Uh, so what we do, we take this outer part just as a, a mass uh, source term that adds to the inner part. Uh, it would be very interesting to investigate, must be investigated better this interface. Finally, the third question that I'm going to address, and we have done some progress in addressing it, uh, is what happens at the surface of the innermost part of this disk, which accrete uh, super Eddington. So, uh, since I'm not sure I can get to the end uh, of my talk, I will uh, um, discuss right now the takeaway points. So, I, I'm going to argue that mass loss uh, in the innermost part of the disk is present and is abundant. Uh, so super Eddington accretion theory is actually uh, not as well understood and actually investigated as the sub Eddington counterpart. So there are so, uh, still many uncertainties. And what I want to show you is that uh, the, the, uh, the theoretical uncertainties that we have in predicting the mass loss that accompany super Eddington accretion is limiting our ability to predict the final mass of the massive black hole seeds from direct collapse. But I'm showing uh, one result, which is that mass loss, do, uh, do, uh, uh, mass loss does affect uh, the final mass of the black hole seed and actually lowers it 
and uh, as a consequence we need uh, higher um, mass for the, the halo that hosts massive black hole seeds. And I will quantify all this, uh, hopefully in time. Okay, so uh, let's go back to this uh, accretion flow structure. So uh, in, in, in the first paper, we were looking for uh, a persistent uh, uh, equilibrium solution. Okay, so we were imposing, so we were uh, altogether neglecting uh, rotation and imposing uh, hydrostatic equilibrium all around. And what we found is that uh, the uh, small black hole is accreting at a rate which is nearly Eddington, which is around Eddington for the whole mass. Since the mass of the innermost part of the disk uh, uh, is at least 10 times, uh, but uh, in, for the parameter space we're interested in, 100 or 1,000 times more massive than the black hole, the black hole is accreting 100 times its own Eddington uh, limit. Uh, this means, uh, by necessity, that the energy is transported inward, uh, outward by convection, not radiation. So most of the mass is in a convective envelope. Only hundreds of the mass is in a small radiative layer. Um, and, and of course, uh, being an Eddington object is radiation pressure dominated. So we have uh, gas pressure to radiation pressure of 10 to the minus 3, 10 to the minus 2. So it's very weakly uh, bound. And this is the whole problem in model these objects. Okay, so uh, the, uh, another important result is that uh, we, we found, okay, so this is, we'll, so we will see it again, so it's worth explaining. So this is the mass of the black hole inside uh, the uh, accretion disk uh, in unit of solar masses, and this is the mass of the innermost envelope. Okay, so what we find is that for uh, um, so for uh, envelope uh, which are 20 or 10 times uh, more massive of the black hole and below, there are no solutions. So uh, for this uh, accretion uh, for mode to be in place, uh, we need very high uh, mass uh, for the surrounding envelope. Okay, so and this is also been confirmed by um, Bol et al with a, a simulation, time-dependent simulation. So uh, since the dynamical times of this object are uh, much shorter than any other dynamical time uh, of the problem, we can construct uh, evolution paths. What does it mean? Okay, so that I, my innermost part of the disk is accreting for the, from the outer disk, but is losing mass from the little black hole. Well, the black hole is accreting with the, the rate that we can consistently solve. And so I can trace uh, this curve. And uh, what we found at that time is that, yes, you can uh, form, for instance, 10 to the 4 solar mass black hole in one million year. After that, uh, the, you hit this no solution zone. And what we think, because it's never been modeled, is that at that point, the black hole is big enough that unbound this innermost part, and then accretion proceeds normally from the outer part of the disk, of the protogalactic disk. Okay, so putting this physical ingredient into emerger tree um, simulations, we have seen this before, uh, these authors found that uh, the average mass uh, of the seeds so this is his mass function of seeds from uh, this model, is around 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6. Okay, so I'm going to challenge this. Okay, so why? Okay, so this is, is the uh, radiative, uh, so let's concentrate on this curve, and what I'm plotting is density towards radius of the innermost part of the disk. Okay, uh, so, and this is, is the radiative layer inwards. So uh, imposing hydrostatic equilibrium all the way out, what we get is a density inversion. Okay. And the other side of the coin is that, so again, so this is basically radius. This is the Eddington ratio minus one. So above this is above Eddington. So we have that in the radiative layer, also of some uh, models, this is proxy for the mass uh, of the object. 
we have super Eddington uh, fluxes compensated by the inversion of the density. So what this is telling us is that the envelope wants to expand, okay, wants to find another equilibrium. Okay. So uh, how we should treat the radiative layer? Okay, so things become complicated then because we enter in the realm of the super Eddington atmospheres. Okay, so observationally, uh, we know that some objects like uh, classical novi or luminous uh, blue variable like eta carine have super Eddington phases which last uh, much longer than they in dynamical time. So people say they have stable uh, super Eddington atmosphere. Okay. Uh, theoretically, uh, very smart people work out the condition um, uh, in an Eddington atmosphere and they all found that they are unstable. Uh, photon bubble with or without magnetic field under very uh, particular opacity conditions or even without magnetic field and Eddington atmospheres. The results of all these theoretical studies is that you have a porous uh, atmosphere, an homogeneous atmosphere. So uh, this is a drawing. So this is my convective envelope. This is the radiative layer that now has become disomogeneous. So basically the radiation has preferred fast track to get out. So uh, these disomogeneities uh, see a sub Eddington flux because most of the mass goes through these channels. So actually, this part of the layer is in hydrostatic equilibrium. So it can be modeled as an hydrostatic equilibrium radiative layer with a reduced opacity. Uh, <coughs> and that's how we do it. Uh, but uh, as you go outwards, so a few scale height, uh, this disomogeneity becomes uh, optically thin. So now they see that they are in a super Eddington uh, uh, flow and a wind starts. And in most of the models that we, um, that we saw, the sonic point coincides with the critical point, uh, which is the point at which the uh, gravity cancels uh, the uh, radiative pool. And so the sonic point is just outside this uh, uh, porous atmosphere. And then at some point there will be some uh, photosphere, okay? What is the mass loss rate? Okay, so this is, this is the difficult bit. Okay, so if we knew uh, the uh, sonic radius, uh, the, we can calculate the density and south spin there, then we have the mass loss. Okay, so we like to put it, uh, uh, to write the mass loss as an efficiency times the maximum mass loss that you can have which is when you convert all the luminosity into kinetic energy from, for the, the wind. Okay, so this is an efficiency. What is this efficiency? Okay, to do this, we, one should solve the three-dimensional um, structure of the porous atmosphere, uh, solving the nonlinear stage of the um, uh, instabilities, for all the parameter space we want. Okay, so we didn't have all this. Uh, we don't have all this. Uh, so what we did is that, so for low efficiencies, uh, so basically, okay, you can write the efficiency like this. Okay, but then we put a fudge factor uh, and we calibrate the low efficiency so that the mass loss reproduce the mass loss observed for a blue luminous variable, like eta carine. Okay, so low efficiency, we uh, calibrate to observation. For high efficiency, in what is called photon tiring regime, a regime uh, where uh, photons are tired of pushing the wind, and actually most of the energy is given to the, uh, to the wind, I will quantify in a second, uh, we use uh, uh, 3D simulations of super Eddington flows uh, um, from massive stars. Okay, so uh, high-end simulation and low-end observations. Gamma is the Eddington ratios. Okay, so if you know the mass loss, <laughs> you know everything. 
so first of all, we can calculate the evaporation time scale. So the time scale for the innermost part, this envelope, to, uh, uh, to lose all its mass at the current rate and compare it with the accretion time scale, so the time scale for the black hole, to double its mass. Okay. Then, of course, uh, once you have the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the M dot, uh, you can uh, uh, solve your one-dimensional uh, Parker model for the, for the wind. And so you can calculate the photosphere and the leftover luminosities that uh, reach us. So there are also bad news for observers here. Um, so uh, let's concentrate first uh, to rates. Okay, so this is, uh, is adding to ratio, uh, so this is, is mass loss from the wind, and this is, is mass of the envelope for a given black hole. So I'm fixing the black hole, and I'm putting it in a bigger and bigger pile of mass, basically. So uh, you see the uh, M dot in, in a phase in which not much, much energy is given to the wind, it increases very much. So the efficiency increases, and then when it comes to the photon timing regime, where the luminosity has dropped by a factor of 10, I will explain better in the next slide, um, then the efficiency uh, is uh, saturating towards one slowly. However, uh, so and there is a, a point at which the evaporation time scale equals the accretion time scale. Okay, so on this part of the diagram, the evaporation time scale is very short compared to the accretion time scale. So if I take uh, 10 to the uh, 100 solar mass black hole in uh, I don't, I don't, 10 to the 4 um, solar mass envelope, this envelope will be evaporated before the black hole can actually accrete. So the black hole can only accrete in this part of the diagram where the evaporation time scale is longer than the accretion time scale. In this region, mass loss are very high. So 60 solar mass per year or higher. Okay. And what about luminosities? Okay, so this is the other axis. This is adding to ratios. So this one is the luminosity of, uh, at the sonic point. So this is, is the luminosity at which the black hole is accreting and goes from uh, Eddington ratio of two, so two times Eddington of the whole mass, so uh, to six times Eddington, okay? And this one is actually the luminosity at the photosphere. So this mismatch is the energy that has been given to the wind, okay? So in this part of the diagram where we actually, um, if you want to observe uh, the growth of black holes, we have uh, that most of the energy is actually given to the wind and the, the luminosity that can, we can see sorry, uh, are uh, quite low. We are talking about 10 to the uh, 52, 10 to the 51 for object the redshift, uh, 10 to 50, oh my, sorry. Okay. Uh, so, uh, Okay, so this was one black hole. Um, okay, so that I do an array of black hole for each one, the masses. I have a strip, a photo, what we call evaporation strip. And here you cannot grow black holes. Okay, so you have to go, uh, to go at very high mass of the envelope. So the bottom line here is that uh, let's go to, everybody is mentioning 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6, okay, to get 10 to the 5, you need to have an envelope of almost 10 to the 8 solar mass. Otherwise, you cannot do it. Uh, and these are found only in halo of 10 to the 10 solar mass, redshift 10, or 10 to the 9, redshift 15. And I bet if, uh, so if Jared takes, as a, uh, so takes only the stars that, uh, that will uh, generate 10 to the 5 solar mass black hole, its rate will be very low. So... Um, that's it. Okay. Questions? Oh, there is one down there. One of the 
way to uh, measure the mass loss rate is to compare the it to the si so-called single scattering limit. So the winds that you are estimating are exceeding this limit by how much? I didn't understand the question. I didn't hear it. Can you raise your voice and, and repeat OK, the so I will stand up and speak again. Um, it's, so there are two limits for the mass loss rate. One is the single scattering limit, and the other is the luminosity limit. And uh, from your talk, I understand that you uh, find that ma mass loss rate is exceeding the single scattering limit. So I was wondering by how much. I don't know. I, I don't know how to quantify it. OK. Lucha? So these are our, our, our optical sequins. So. Just a, a comment that your result is quite interesting because it, you know, for example, in, in the merger model that Sylvia discussed this morning, because we grow the, the, the red collapse seed at much lower redshift in very big yellows, in very high sigma peaks, we would actually satisfy your, your constraint that you have to be a very, very high halo mass in order to, to grow the seed. Yeah. But the other uh, point, which is actually a question, is I haven't, and so the accretion rate from the disk, you call it a disk, but it's basically the, the, the high angular momentum tail of your envelope. How does that affect what, what you show? I mean, because you have, you know, the inflow rate comes from the larger scale. Yeah. And okay, so um, actually, um, okay, let's see if I, okay, so uh, the envelope, uh, okay, so accrete from the disk and loses mass through the wind and the accretion. But actually, the uh, wind is so, uh, fast, uh, I mean, it's so um, uh, prominent okay. that actually is the one that dominates. So the mass actually is always decreasing. Mm -hmm. uh, so here it's 10, but we tried uh, uh, up to 50 and beyond. Mm -hmm. So as long as this is smaller than this, uh, is the mass loss. And we are talking about 60 solar mass uh, per second, or 100 uh, per year, yeah, <laughs> 100 solar mass per year. So you need to have very high accretion rate to compete with that. Mm -hmm. so, the, uh, so that's why it's transient. It lasts only for uh, 10 to the 4 years, uh, this fast accretion period. Yeah. Are there other questions? Well, if not, let us thank can again. Can I say one thing? Yes. Yes, you can. So I'll do a question to myself. <laughs> so, what about 10 to the 6? Uh, OK, so, yeah. <laughs> so the problem is, uh, very good question. So the problem is that uh, to, uh, to have 10 to the 6, uh, you have to have an envelope greater than 10 to the 8. And that's been shown long ago. Uh, that uh, uh, envelope of mass greater than 10 to the 4 are actually very unstable by, by pulsation instability. So even if you try to pile up more mass than 10 to the 8, uh, your envelope is trying to get rid of it. So actually, if uh, this is, is uh, a hard limit, uh, with, with our implementation of the feedback, you cannot have uh, seats of 10 to the 6 or higher. Thank you. Okay, so we reconvene at 4.10 for the last part of the session. <laughs>